Okay, so you're here for the lightning talks. And you've got Melanie on first with uh, zero knowledge, and I really hope you like Michael Caine. Hello. Hi. So my name is Mel. Uh, I mostly do product security, and I spent six months during the pandemic researching about zero knowledge protocols. Um, so zero knowledge is a protocol of it's a set of protocols for encryption. And the best way I can explain it is by giving you an analogy. So imagine Stigman Bruce trying to enter his house and normally he has his keys because it's his house. Um, but this time, well, this time Michael Caine, well, sorry, uh, Alfred has the keys. And the only way for Stigman Bruce to enter his house, which is not the Wayne Manor, is the Powerpuff Girls house for some reason. Um, uh, Alfred has to ask him a set of questions to prove that he is indeed Bruce. So questions could be like, uh, what year did you buy your sofa? Or what's in the cupboard of your kitchen? So only things that Bruce would know because it's his house. So um, there's two types of zero knowledge. One is the interactive one. So interactive zero knowledge uh, refers to uh, a way of authenticating or um, uh, verifying someone's identity, in this case, Bruce, by sending a request, and every single request uh, is gonna have a challenge immediately after sending that request. So imagine one of the proofs that uh, Bruce is gonna give is uh, that he bought some Fusilli uh, with his Tesco card on the 26th of November of 2021, and Alfred is gonna be very interested to hear more about that every time he goes through the list of the shop. Uh, the other type of zero knowledge is non-interactive. So in this case, the challenges and requests are processed in a batch. So um, instead of Stigma and Bruce giving him a list um, of what items were, he's just gonna hand him an encrypted grocery list um, from Tesco's. And Alfred is gonna be also very interested in hearing and reading that. Um, so, in order for a protocol, an encryption protocol to be classified as zero knowledge, it has to abide to three properties. One of them is uh, completeness. So um, every single step has to be complied. Um, Bruce has to verify and answer every single question that Alfred is gonna ask him. Uh, rationality, so if Bruce were, were to make a mistake just once, that break zero knowledge and that is gonna prove a fail and it's gonna be disregarded. The final one is zero knowledge, which is um, the whole point of these uh, protocol suites, which is the only information that Alfred can have is that that is the person itself. Uh, he can only believe that the person is who they say they are, but they cannot know any sort of pers personal information. In this case, um, passwords or anything like that. So if we translate this uh, chaotic uh, analogy, um, whenever a zero protocol, um, the way zero protocols work is that you're gonna have a prover and a verifier. So in this case, the prover is gonna be Bruce and the verifier is gonna be Alfred. Um, and this uh, going a bit more technical, imagine you have a password and you're authenticating with the service. What you're gonna do is you're gonna create a signature of that password, so the, a hash of that password, and you're gonna send that hash to the server or the verifier or Alfred. Alfred is gonna grab that hash. Um, Alfred is gonna create a signature with that hash, is gonna sign it as well, and is gonna send back that signature to Bruce. This could be a public key, for example. And then um, Alfred is gonna store that hash and is gonna send a random token signed with the service signature, offer signature, and it's gonna send it back to Bruce. Bruce is gonna then prove that it can sign that signature and send it back to Alfred, and Alfred is gonna like perform some calculations to check that the, the contents, the hash, has been signed with the signature that he shared. Um, so the whole point here is that there's never a password being sent or stored anywhere. It's always gonna be a signature of a password or a hash of a password or a signed hash. Nobody's ever knowing, the server is never knowing what the contents of the password actually is. Um, and uh, 
not trying to go uh, very technical here, but uh, one way zero knowledge protocols do this is by using something called elliptic curves. So the way a server or AFRED would create these random tokens or signatures, they could use elliptic curves. So the way this would work is Bruce would send the hash password to Alfred, Alfred would put that hash password into a point generator that is gonna give an X and Y point that is gonna go on an elliptic curve. And that way is gonna verify uh, from the subsequent challenges or uh, attempts of uh, authenticating if uh, the hash does indeed um, generate the same point in the curve. Um, and that's a good way of like verifying um, for this. Um, uh, my research mostly involved possible applications of zero knowledge, and one of them was using single sign-on authentication. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, like single sign-on is, we use it every day, and it's, uh, for example, when you wanna log in to uh, an application using your Gmail account, and you select signing in with Google, or you're using things like Okta signing. Um, so, um, I was researching um, the way you do single sign-on usually is with SAML uh, for large enterprises. So I was uh, researching into re-architecting the whole SAML flow by adding a step where instead of verifying the password, you would verify the hash of a password and you would involve a more zero knowledge architecture to it. Um, I found out in a, in a survey I did that most people would be happy to not have to um, input their password every single time, but the challenges with this sort of applications is that to compute those calculations with the elliptic curves, it takes a long time. So um, as of now, it would take about a minute with the research I've done to sort of compute without having to store your password, which is not great. Um, and the whole concept of zero, I'll finish with uh, the whole concept of zero knowledge was actually from the 80s, but it was sort of science fiction at the time because we didn't have the computing power to perform such calculations. And nowadays we're sort of getting closer to zero knowledge. So it could potentially be the future for authentication without passwords. And that's Michael Caine. <laughs> Okay, one speaker presses the buttons for the next speaker. You can hear me, that's great. Okay, so next up we have Adventures in Cosplay with Claire Mar Holland, and I th think you'll find it, it's a real, oh, a real breath of the wild. However, the slides have just disappeared. Somebody press the right button. Oh no. Yes. Oh yes. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Um, and I am here to talk about making this. <laughs> and yes, it was quite an adventure. Um, next slide, please. Um, so from the beginning, it took a long time to figure out what shapes I was actually wanting to, to design here. Um, the uh, sword itself comes in different layers. I'm not sure if you can see that very well. Um, but it, the design process took quite a while to figure out what I actually wanted to laser cut. Um, and this has been made out of um, kind of a very transparent acrylic. But next slide, please. Um, the process of laser cutting it, <laughs> let's just say there was a lot of burnt wood, a lot of burnt wood. That took a number of attempts. Um, but yes, eventually, we got something that would slot together. As you can see here, this is very good at pointing actually. Um, as you can see here, there are uh, little holes cut out in each of the layers because there's screws uh, that go the whole way through and is actually what keeps it together. But there's 10 of them. And every time I have to change the battery or something breaks, I have to unscrew all of them. Um, <laughs> so if we go to the next slide, um, here you can see all of the pieces there's a lot. These ones needed glued together. It was a long process. Um, and the shield itself, this also took quite a while, but the sword is the pain here. Um, so yes, sword, lots of pieces. Next slide. 
Uh, we had some tests as well with cardboard because the, we only had so much acrylic here. I uh, didn't want to waste that. Um, but thankfully, we did get a working model here. I kind of I kind of like it with the wood, but Link's sword is blue slash purple, so we couldn't keep it. It, it did smell quite nice. Burnt wood is quite nice. But anyway, um, next slide, please. Um, here you can see it assembled. Um, yet again, 10 screws, 10 screws. Um, <laughs> and is is important to note also that there is a, um, a battery pack in the hilt here. It takes up about 75%, wasn't a good idea. Um, but next slide, here you can see the, um, the shield, which we decided to do out of clear acrylic that was then spray painted um, on the back so that it could be waterproof. Um, so each of these pieces spray painted individually and then screwed on to the wood, um, which was cut in two pieces, and it made that. Also, these straps are really not good for skin, so, well, we make do. Um, next slide. Uh, here is uh, the electronics phase. Um, sorry, I keep forgetting about this. Um, it's did not go well originally. Safe to say, last time I did soldering was about four years before this. Um, I didn't realize that you're supposed to keep the pin separate, but it's fine. My brother then told me that's why it's not working. Um, but yes, there's a double-sided LED strip, as you can probably tell the whole way up the blade itself, that is then attached to a trinket in the hilt, or in the 25% of the hilt that's still left. Um, and then the rest is just wires. It's just wires. It's a complete mess in there, but it works. That's what's important here. Always remember, regardless of your project, as long as it works at the end, you've made it. That's all that matters. Um, <laughs> but yes, and I think there's only one more slide. Yes, so as you can see, finished product, um, I would still probably do this again. There's still parts I would uh, improve upon. Mainly the, the hilt of the sword is massive. I have small hands. Um, <laughs> not, not the best idea, but yet again, the battery pack is huge. So we had to fit it in there somehow. Um, but yes, uh, moral of the story, make things. It's great. Would highly recommend. <laughs> As with all the speakers, I think they'll be hanging around at the end, so if you need to ask them any questions, then uh, at least Claire's really easy to find. Um, do we have Casper in the room? Yes. So next up is Casper. Uh, this talk does contain the word flange, which I find really like hilarious. I don't know why I love the word flange, but there is the word flange in that. It's on one of your slides. I've, I've been licking. Would you like this microphone or that microphone? Uh, I guess I could pick a hand on the There you go. Five minutes or ten? Uh, five. Five minutes. I'm pretty sure. Hand you over, just move on to your next slide down. Thanks. So, my name is Casper, and I'm here to talk about kitspace.org, which is a website to share electronics projects that I created. Uh, it looks a bit like this just lots and lots of PCBs, all kinds of stuff. Just kind of decorative stuff since uh, NASA has a project on it. It's a hobby rover. But um, um, yeah, that's kind of what the website looks like. When you go into a page, you get links to order the PCBs. So you can click on one of these sponsor links and it goes directly into the uh, PCB batching service website. Or you can compare prices or you can just download the Gerber files and send them wherever you like. Um, you get a preview of the board. Uh, you can click on this assembly guide that works for KiCad and Eagle projects, and it gives you a, uh, I wish I had a picture of that. I should have done a slide of that. But uh, interact interactively go through the PCB and each component, and it shows you where to place it. So it's good for uh, 
hand soldering and you can just inspect the Gerber files as well on another uh, website to go through to see if everything looks right. Uh, there's below that, there's links to buy the parts. So that's some of the automation I built. You just click on, if, if, especially if it's a green link like that, you can click on the DigiKey link and that puts all the parts you need for that project into your DigiKey shopping site or any of these other distributors. You can go through the bill of materials and it shows you all the information you need on each component as long as the, the person that's put the project up has put all that information in there. Not, not like the retrieved information, but just the basic part information. And from that, we can get further information. We can get the data sheet. We can get all the specs of the components. Then below that, you'll find a readme. And that, that's kind of typical for a project to just where the creator explains more about it. It's the website itself is all open source, so you can uh, go on github.com slash kitspace, where the kitspace is the current website. We're working on version two, which is integrating uh, Gitty, which is an open source GitHub clone. We're integrating that as the back end, and we're currently working on that. We've got a few other things interesting that might be interesting to you to, if you're into electronics, we have some, we've been collecting KiCad footprints. We have a kind of a nice, uh, Awesome Electronics is called just a list of resources that are uh, interesting if you're into electronics or want to get into electronics. Um, yeah. Uh, so one of the things that I've been working on as sort of part of this is uh, some standardization efforts uh, together with what's called the Internet of Production Alliance. So we're trying to figure out, can we standardize bill of materials, part information, and all of that. And, and come up with a better way to make electronics that makes it more repairable and reusable down the line. Uh, and that's available at this link if you want to know more about that. Um, that's in the early stages. So we, we love to talk to people about that, what kind of ideas they have, how a standard could help in that area. Uh, so that's really my talk. I don't know how I'm doing on time. But uh, these are the important links. Check it out on, on github.com slash kitspace or check out the standard. Uh, always open to contributions, always open to people putting their projects up. So, thanks very much. Oh, I have free PCB rulers and stickers if anyone is interested in that. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, nice, easy uh, web link to, to uh, remember. Kit space, it's a space with kits on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I've put my notes down somewhere, but Kate is up next. <laughs> so, will you be using this microphone? Excellent. So, the people mover and why Elon Musk can suck it. Heck yeah! We're actually not going to talk that much about Elon Musk because he sucks. <laughs> oh no, wait, which button do I push to go down? Right. Yes. So, my brother lives in Las Vegas. And in Las Vegas, you now have the Las Vegas Convention Center Loop, which is supposed to be this amazing public transportation system of the future, where you can go from one end of the convention center to the other in two minutes. Right? Fantastic sounding, right? You know what it is? It's a bunch of Teslas in a tunnel. It's... It's tunnels, ooh, tunnels, operational tunnels. We'll go to the airport in a tunnel. Yeah, you know what happens when you have a bunch of cars in a tunnel, even if they're electric cars? Traffic. <laughs> traffic jams, you got traffic jams in a damn tunnel. You get traffic jams on the road above. And there were Teslas, so you know, they'll catch fire and then you can't get out because you can't figure out the doors because you're not a tech person. You're at the International Proctologist Convention. What do you know? So you die in a fire. And the reason why it sucks the most is because it is not the people mover. <laughs> the people mover was a transportation system that was installed in 1967. I want to make that clear, 67. It gave you a tour around Tomorrowland and Disneyland. It had linear induction motors. They make the wheel, they make tires turn, which push the cars around. And the cars constantly move. There's no traffic because they're still going all the time. And you go from a moving platform 
to a moving car. So you don't even have to stop the cars at any time to let people on and off. It's based on this amazing, they have amazing names because it was the 50s when they did it. The Carveyor system. The Speedwalk, speed ramp, Carveyor system developed by Goodyear and Stephen Adams Manufacturing. This is one of their patent pictures that they did for it. It was for, they were gonna do this great big system in, the, uh, in New York, and it was gonna go from Grand Central Station to all the hot spots in New York. And you see they've got the conveyor belt, they've got the little moving cars, everything keeps on moving along perfectly, whoosh, 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 no traffic, no stopping, nothing. And also, there's a lovely billboard for rockets, so obviously, by the time this is installed, you're going to the moon. <laughs> the people mover in Disneyland in Los Angeles looked like that. God, that looked beautiful. Look how beautiful that is. You had the beautiful sun, the sun was protected, the roof. You had lovely open air, and you got to look around all of Tomorrowland and just enjoy a lovely, relaxing tour. See, oh. Look how beautiful that is. You get to watch all the people down underneath and go, oh, look at those poor people. They're not on a people mover. I am. And in fact, that would be where Star Tours was. And in 89, you would get me and my brother up there shouting at people, telling them that Star Tours was a terrible ride and they shouldn't go on it. And then they would leave and then we could get into the line faster. <laughs> it didn't work, but it was worth a shot. They've also, they still have the People Mover at Tomorrowland in Disney World. It's slightly different. You can see that it's got no roofs because the entire uh, course is roofed instead, which makes sense because it rains like every five seconds in Florida. But you can see, look, lovely seats, a lovely tour. You get off your feet and you're relaxed and it's beautiful. There is also, there are People Movers all over the world. Some of them are not as attractive. <laughs> this is the subway in the Dallas International Airport. This is the one that was also designed by Disney Imagineers. But obviously over the years, they tried to modernize it and it just looks terrible. And it's in Dallas. <laughs> so what made it the best? Continually moving, no traffic. Even when it had to slow down, still going. Linear induction run by electricity, no fumes. No massive pollution all over the place. That beautiful 1960s mid-century design, so great. And it had a really awesome soundtrack, which made it absolutely beautiful, so you got to sit back and relax and enjoy it. And it breaks my heart that they got rid of it at Disneyland. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, that's a link to a YouTube video that is the entire one. It also went through the world of Tron, so you could pretend that you were in Tron, so that was also amazing. <laughs> and, yeah, suck eggs, Elon. Walt did this in the 60s. How dare you? How dare you think you can revolutionize a people mover? And how much time do I have left? Yeah, you know what? Y'all are getting two minutes of people mover music. Ah, uh, come on, play louder. There we go. Now imagine you're sitting there, slowly going across Tomorrowland, enjoying this. Thinking, Elon Musk can suck it. Walt Disney's the best. Yeah, okay, he's not the best, but this is the best ride ever. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I could listen to that music all evening. Um, we've got Thomas on next with a very fascinating title, Why Insects Are Cool and How You Can Grow Them in Your Kitchen. O on purpose? Yes. On purpose. You have to move on that close. Yeah. There, if you need it. Okay. That moves on. Okay. Thank you. If you need to go back to the mouth. Yeah. I'll go to the insects.
Um, can you hear me all right? Okay, great. Thanks. So hi, so I'm Thomas. Um, my background is e in economics, but more importantly, I'm a hobbyist um, Olympic weightlifter. So I've always been trying to look for a sustainable protein source. So this is what drew me to edible insects. Um, I started becoming obsessed with them. I learned how to cook them. I learned how to farm them. Um, I'm now an unpaid advocate of the edible insect industry. And I also wrote my bachelor thesis on it. Finally, I also gifted them to my girlfriend's parents, the first time I met them, and well, they weren't really convinced. Um, so, a little bit about insects. So, apart from the crucial role they play in our ecosystem, um, they're also an incredible food source. They're cold-blooded creatures, so they don't, don't waste any energy keeping warm. This means that you need very little feed for them to produce edible food. Um, you don't need much water, because they uh, efficiently extract it from moisture, uh, efficiently extract moisture from fruits, um, and they don't need much land. You can just stack in the boxes and then stack them up. So, environmentally, they're great, but they're also great nutritionally. They've got double the protein content of chicken and triple the, its calories. So they seem a pretty good solution for um, our climate crisis, for which our food system is partly responsible for. So, across um, centuries, many cultures have been eating insects. You've got cicadas eaten by American Indians and Aristotle in ancient Greece. Um, you've got Western Europeans and Chinese eating silkworms. Um, but you've also got the three monotheist religions, all specifically mentioning locusts and grasshoppers in their text. Uh, they're all halal, kosher, and acceptable. These days, most insects are eaten in uh, more tropical regions where they're larger and more abundant. But in Western countries, um, they're still kind of met with disgust. The main reason why is because they were always associated with pests, um, which was obviously not a great sign for um, harvest. Um, but they can always also be used for other uses. For example, for in tr traditional Chinese medicine, they can be, uh, they can extract oil for biofuel, they can be used for pharmaceuticals, for coloring, um, and right now there's a huge growing industry for um, insects as feed, especially aquaculture. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about insects as food. There's three main um, common or popular uh, insect types for use today. So there's the black soldier fly, um, crickets, and mealworms. So I decided to start my own farm with my girlfriend uh, with mealworms. So usually couples uh, decide to get a dog before getting a child. Well, I decided to go with the insect route. Um, okay, so just very simply, uh, how the cycle works is that you first get beetles, they lay eggs. These eggs become mealworms, and then they can become pupae, and they transform into beetles. So the initial setup is pretty simple. You buy beetles online, you put them in a Tupperware box, you want, them, you want it to be not transparent because they like shade, you're going to put oats in them, and a little bit of a toilet roll, because as I said, they want shade. Um, and then you're going to add a little bit of um, vegetable or fruit scraps every so often so they have enough moisture. Then, after a few weeks, uh, you can safely expect they've laid a few eggs. So you're going to put these beetles in a new box. So you have one box of eggs and one box of beetles. The box of eggs, you're going to let them essentially grow into mealworms. When they, they become mealworms, you have two choices. One, uh, you let them become uh, beetles, so your colony grows, which is great. Or you decide to eat them. So that's time for harvest, essentially. So how are you going to harvest them? You're going to put them in a box, and then just put them in a the freezer, so they're in a state of semi-hibernation. And that's going to enable you just to boil them uh, without them really uh, feeling anything, which is um, ideally a, a more humane way of killing them. Um, I think that's one, one important um, issue with, with eating insects, is that for a small amount of protein, you are killing a lot of living beings. So that's one thing to take into account. So me, personally, I haven't actually been able to kill my own mealworms because I've grown so attached to them. Uh, so I think just take that into account. So right now I just have mealworms as pets, more than as food. <laughs> um, yeah, so my favorite, personal favorite recipe is um, you pan fry them, you put some spices, some barbecue sauce, and you can top them on your cheesy nachos. Uh, just in this picture, these are crickets, uh, but you can do the same thing with mealworms. They're crunchy and they're great. Um, yeah, so I hope uh, you, I've piqued your interest. Uh, I've brought actually a few um, dried crickets for you to try, so I'll be at the exit in case you want to try them. Thank you.
I don't know what to say after that. <laughs> Anybody looking forward to lunch? <laughs> um, before we go on to the next talk, I just have a quick question. You're not volunteering yourself right now. Hold, raise your hand if you can press four buttons. Oh, you're not suckered in yet. Keep your hand up if you liked a full cooked breakfast that you don't have to cook or pay for. You can see where I'm going with this, can't you? We need a vision mixer, which basically you press a button and it changes over from slides to the holding slides, etc. Press buttons for an hour, get a free breakfast in the morning. If you're interested, come see me straight after. And we're going to go on to Chris's talk, which is about transporting open static data around the world. Hello, hello. Uh, so when I'm not making um, poor wardrobe uh, choices in a cold field, uh, I'm a tech lead for City Mapper. Um, we do what? Wire. Quiet. Well, that's not my problem. <laughs> hello. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, when, like I said, when, when I'm not making poor wardrobe choices in a cold field, I'm a tech lead for City Mapper. Um, one of the things we do is um, deal with a lot of open data from around the world, um, and it's specific, it's my area specifically is static open data, which I'll explain to you in a second. So, what is it? So, in uh, the world of transport, um, so weirdly, there's been a lot of railway talk this uh, this weekend so far. Um, now it's more about buses, I guess. Uh, but also railways, um, we have kind of two types of uh, data. One is static and one is dynamic. Dynamic is the kind of data we talk about, like when is the bus going to arrive, um, is it disrupted, and that kind of thing. Static data is more like what's the timetable for the next two weeks for the, uh, the buses or the trains or whatever. Um, where are all the stops? Like what was their lat longs and what they're called? Uh, what are the routes? Like you've got, I don't know, a tube line or a bus line or a bus route, whatever. What are they called? Where do they go? Who operates them? Um, what time do they get to the stops uh, and what kind of shape do they go to get there uh, and how much do they cost? Um, the last one's quite tricky. Um, so there's quite a lot of places around the world that publish this data openly. Uh, the way they do this is kind of a bit hit and miss <laughs> uh, in terms of like standards. Um, so yeah, here's, here's a few of them. Uh, timetables inherently are complicated. It might sound relatively simple, like having a list of things that, you know, vehicles that go to different stops at different times, but like, does it go there on Tuesdays? Does it go there on bank holiday weekends? Does it go there um, uh, throughout the entire day? Is it a fixed frequency or you know, are there specific trips that happen and do they change? And do, do you have waiting times in different parts? Does it split? All this kind of stuff makes this quite tricky. So there's a few standards that uh, exist uh, for this kind of thing. Um, GTFS is probably the most widely used one. Um, it, Google kind of invented it. Um, uh, and uh, it's pretty much the de facto standard in most places. Uh, but um, some of the trailblazers, like, like the UK, for example, and New York, to some extent, um, have <laughs> had to invent their own standards. Trans Exchange, uh, UK buses uh, use a lot of Trans Exchange. Uh, there's NetX in, in Europe. Uh, TFL has its own API. Having your own API seems to be a thing that um, big operators like to do. It's really annoying. Uh, they like to do it anyway. Um, MOTC is quite a good one. Uh, it's the Taiwan uh, uh, Open Data API. Uh, it's like really well documented, super awesome. Trouble is the data that goes into it isn't always right, but that's not, <laughs> that's not their fault. Um, sometimes they'll just give you like a bunch of random CSVs and they don't tell you what anything means, which is really helpful. Uh, so, you know, that's a problem. And sometimes they don't even give you anything like structured data, they'll just give you a PDF timetable, like it's literally what they would print to put in like the uh, leaflet uh, holders in, in buses. Uh, and, they, and that's open data apparently. Uh, <laughs> so you have to figure out what to do with that. Oh, and Tokyo, you can talk to me about Tokyo later, but that's a world of fun. Um, so with uh, this open data, just because the standard is, is uh, fixed doesn't mean that the data is actually right. Um, one of the problems that comes up really frequently uh, in these data feeds, and, and is actually picked up by a bunch of validators, uh, so GTFS validators, is too fast vehicles. So uh, what happens in this particular instance uh, is you either have stops are in the wrong place, uh, so they're too far away, usually. Um, or the time that a bus calls at those two stops is not correct. 
uh, either they've done something silly like you know only added one second and then it goes over like 100 meters and it's going 100 meters a second quite fast for a bus um, or they've just like moved they've <laughs> Uh, put all of the bus stops in the North Sea, totally thing that happened. Uh, so, so yeah, you'd see all of these buses kind of going through London, then teleport into the North Sea and then teleport back again. And obviously, that's wrong. Um, not many people want to go to the North Sea, either, so it's not very helpful either. Um, so, yeah, there are validators that pick this kind of thing up. Um, interestingly, the validators use um, uh, rules about the mode. So it knows that buses go at, you know, an average speed of, I think it's like, 50 uh, kilometers per hour or something. Uh, but uh, trains are supposed to go at 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, we suspect that this is because it was developed by Americans who have a really bad train network. Uh, and actually, trains do go faster than that everywhere else in the world. So, you know, I made a pull request. They didn't really like it very much. <laughs> Thought I was boasting. Anyway, <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about route type. Um, so route type uh, is a field in, in the GTFS spec. Um, and uh, this is the list of all of the, the routes that exist in the transport data. Um, so you know, the bus routes, the train routes, and so on. Uh, one of the fields is route type. And this is supposed to describe what kind of a vehicle or what kind of a service is run. Um, it's a relatively short list. So the one on the side is, is kind of the basic ones. Um, you might think, like, who's got funicular or an aerial lift? It's like, actually, a surprising number of places have funiculars. Um, I think there's probably about 13 that I know of in Europe. Um, and cable cars, there's one in London, as it turns out. Well, <laughs> weirdly, it doesn't use GTFS, but never mind. Um, so, yeah, uh, being able to describe things in a bit more granularity is quite helpful. Um, in particular, certain kinds of regional rail services being described differently to local rail services is quite handy. Um, but uh, when people tried to extend this, Google kind of just went, oh, yeah, we'll just give you some more route types and you can just use it, but failed to actually make it part of the standard for some reason. Um, so people started using them, wasn't part of the standard. So now everyone has to use the Google standard, which is not the standard uh, because everyone else is using it. So it's kind of de facto. Um, and then at some point, a bunch of people said, maybe we should make this official. That would be a good idea. Um, and then typically, um, we over-engineered it. Uh, we ended up adopting or trying to adopt uh, a whole list of these vehicle types from TPEG, which is a broadcast radio standard, weirdly. Um, which is designed for sending traffic information to um, uh, navigation systems like TomToms you know, and that sort of thing. I'm not sure it's actually used anywhere, but that was the intention of it. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, this does include rather a lot of other things which you probably would never have in a GTFS feed, like post boat surface. I mean, I know they exist, but like, does anyone need that in their GTFS feed? I don't know. Uh, or airship service, um, which, uh, I mean, be nice, but I don't think anyone's going to be uh, launching an airship service in the near future. Um, we'll, we'll see, though, I guess. <laughs> um, fares. Ah, fares. They're good. Um, they're really complicated because in some places, the fare system might be quite straightforward. Uh, so a zoning-based system, relatively easy to represent. Problem is, that's not the same everywhere. So if you want one system that is able to, to deal with calculating fares basically anywhere in the world, uh, you have to build a really general system. Um, and uh, I can't remember who, who, it said, who said this, but um, any internal engineering project always tends toward an uh, implementation of a Lua parser. It's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of where you're going with this. Uh, so GTFS does support this, but it doesn't do it very well, in my opinion. Um, also, Heathrow and TFL Rail uh, are a pain in the bum, because uh, they do weird things. Uh, also, disruptions. So tra static data, you might not think, hasn't got very much to do with real-time uh, data and disruptions, but actually, you do need to know it, because when you look at a disruption feed, a whole different topic, you need to be able to line up like what it's saying that's being disrupted with something that's in the timetable, so you can, when you're route planning, you can actually assign the disruption to the route. Um, this can be quite complicated. Uh, neat, uh, specifically because disruptions are often not structured. So there'll be just like some uh, plain, um, yeah, plain text um, that kind of says the central line is disruptive between Oxford Circus and Bank, um, which is fine as long as you know what the central line is and the fact that it's a route, what Oxford Circus is and what Bank is. Uh, it's quite tricky. Uh, so right, 
this is what this is how city mapper deals with all of this nonsense uh we have this thing it's called cargo chain it's like one of our oldest code bases um and it does all of the transformations for all these weird data formats. It also fixes things like buses that go too fast and stuff like that. Um, and uh, just produces like a standard format, which um, is similar to one of those standards I mentioned earlier, but not PDF timetables, because that'd be silly. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and then we have a thing that checks um, the consistency of the data as well. Uh, so counting the number of chips is a good way of approximating whether things have changed massively. Uh, there's a whole load of other stuff. And also we can validate it ourselves to see if we've introduced any errors. Um, so yeah, that's basically um, how that works uh, in a very condensed period of time. <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> I'm Alex, I am a radiographer and I'm also an amateur maker and um, I bought a 3D printer and that became a bit of a problem for me because everything needed to be print printed, 3D printed and not everything can be 3D printed, a lot of things you find 3D printing is not strong enough for so I instead of scaling back what I wanted to 3D print I decided to go the other way and find out how to <coughs> excuse me, and um, tried to find out how to make my 3D prints stronger. So the avenue that I've taken is um, basically composite materials. So we are 3D printing um, shells for what I want to make and um, filling them with epoxy resin or epoxy and some other filler material. And this is kind of what you'd need to do that. This is what you'd need to do that. I'm okay. okay, thank you. So the method is to design what you'd want to make and you need to consider how you're gonna slice it when you have designed what you're gonna make. Um, so a few things like perimeters, you will need at least two perimeters. You cannot do base mode with this because it'll be too leaky. Um, three perimeters are better, as long as it's not a really, really small part. Um, infill, if you can avoid using infill, that is way, way better. Um, if you need to use infill, then use gyroid fill, because that uh, connects the whole inside space of the part. If you use something like grid or rectilinear, you will have individual um, pockets within your part which won't fill with the epoxy resin. Um, and you absolutely need four or more top layers um, to get a good seal if you're doing top layers. Um, so 3D print it. Um, so that's my CAD up there. That's my CAD. This is my 3D part. This is not the same 3D part, obviously. Um, you will have invisible holes that you can't see. So you'll need to fill those holes with some kind of sealant and I've used lacquer spray, just like car spray paint, lacquer. Um, once you've printed your part, if you don't leave it open like this, you uh, will need to drill some holes in your part or, or print in your holes, um, but drilling them is easier. One to let the epoxy in or inject the epoxy in and one to let the air out. And you can then fill your part and then wait for it to set. Depending on what epoxy you use, it can take a long time to set or it can be very, very quick. And there's a definite trade-off in what you're trying to do. Um, so this is the part I showed you earlier with the CAD design and this is it ready to slice or being sliced. And you can see I have not included a top layer to make it really easy just to pour it in. I don't need to inject, I don't need to drill it, it's really simple. Um, and you would think you can just turn off the top layers and that'll be fine. But because I've got holes within that, they need top layers. So if you uh, turn off the top layers globally for your print, you won't get top layers above your holes, which is very leaky. It will leak everywhere. 
Um, so I've used a height modifier just to select the top few millimeters and just said don't print the top layer over those. Um, so this is me sealing them, pouring them, and there's some other parts there which I'm injecting them. So if you use a three mil drill bit, you get perfect size hole for a normal Lurlock syringe. Um, so the reasons that I want to do that, and I do this, is because you can potentially, depending on what fillers and composites you use, you can make your 3D prints almost as strong as aluminium, yet it's still workable. You can still um, machine it if you need to, if you need to make some changes, if you put a hole in the wrong place, for example, or your hole turns out too small. Um, it's not very expensive, and you can make it even cheaper if you're willing to deal with certain things which really reek, absolutely stink. Um, you can color it if you want, uh, and I'll show you a little bit of that later. Um, epoxy it is a little bit stronger and a little bit less brittle than PLA, um, and but the main advantage is it won't fail along your layer lines, um, so it's a contiguous uh, Thing inside your print. Um, some of the disadvantages are the shell of an object transmits most of the force. So if you're putting a lot of force onto an object, uh, you need it to have a strong shell, and your, your shell is only going to be as strong as the PLA. Um, small features won't get any epoxy in, and that is a major pitfall, which I've fallen into multiple times. Um, PLA is never really bio biodegradable, but your print definitely won't be biodegradable if you fill it full of epoxy. Um, things take an age to cure, and you need to be a bit careful about the heat. So if you get a quick curing epoxy, it gives off a lot of heat and it can melt your, um, your shell before it actually is cured. Yep. Um, so this is my hacky racer. Um, this, I went all out on this technique of um, 3D printing the shells and filling with epoxy, and you can see the results. So uh, that is one of, that's the wheel that should be there. It is over there, and it has a broken pitman arm. Um, that one has an attached pitman arm, but you can see from the angle that is not right. Um, the collars for uh, the steering wheel to turn on work really well. And this is a lie, it is not a success. This is the reason I'm not racing it today. <laughs> because the wheel fell off the steering wheel. Uh, so it's back in the car. <laughs> um, these are absolute successes. Um, and you can see I'm putting some faith into these prints. Uh, they hold up the heavy bikes. I will definitely cry if I fell on my car. Um, these are quite chunky parts. These are things from Thingiverse. Sorry, I haven't uh, attributed, but... Uh, and they are printed just with no top, well, no top layer or bottom layer, depending on which way up they were, and filled with um, glass fiber and epoxy, and they will never break. I have hit them with hammers just to make sure they will not break. <laughs> and this is a pretty thing. Um, so this is exactly the same technique. This is just uh, top layers, and this is my house sign that I made because the one that came with our house was disgusting. Um, so this is just for perimeters. I think it's three perimeters on this one. And um, I've included the, the street name as well as just the same layer, same height as the, the shell. And it's filled with um, normal clear epoxy resin uh, deep cure. So it took uh, about three days to cure. Um, and I used about 4% um, black and to make it a little bit gray, a little bit of white uh, acrylic paint. It is actually a little bit transparent. You, you can't see it on here, but the uh, little holders that clip onto the screws um, are within the epoxy, and um, they're just visible within there. It's almost like smoked glass, um, but if you use maybe up to 10% of the acrylic, you can, you can get there thoroughly. And that's it. So go for make strong things or pretty things. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, thank you, Alex. Yet another fascinating talk. I think you'll agree they've all been really brilliant talks. So if you can give all the speakers another round of applause.